and the subtext or the subtitle will be thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. And I've given you a background. Uh, I was at first going to give you a clip from the Charlie Brown Christmas special, but I decided I wouldn't do that. Um, but you know what you can do? You go to YouTube um, and you can find it on YouTube. You can see the whole special. And I don't mind recommending it because the creator of the Peanuts and Charlie Brown what was a committed Christian, a very, very committed Christian, um, as you will see if you, go, if you go back and look at that. But I put this as a backdrop because uh, I was reminded of it as I was preparing um, throughout the week and then yesterday as well. Uh, it's a, it's a I don't know about Hong Kong, but in the U.S., uh, starting around Christmas time, starting actually at Thanksgiving, there's so many Christmas specials. Oh, there are the Hallmark Christmas movies. Everything's warm and fuzzy. And then there are all of these old classics as well. And one of the classics, it's 55 years old this year, is this, uh, I'm not going to preach about cartoons, by the way. This is just our <laughs> intro as we come into it, um, is the Charlie Brown Christmas special. And I was thinking of it because... Uh, this is a scene from the Charlie Brown Christmas special. Charlie Brown has his hat on, and that's Linus, the one who's sucking his thumb with his blanket. And the whole part of it, especially as it begins, Charlie Brown is having a terrible Christmas. He, he has no Christmas spirit. You know what I mean, right? And he comes outside in the snow, and he looks in, the, in, in his mailbox, and he says, rats. No Christmas cards. I hate, I hate this holiday season. Nobody likes me anyhow. And he has no Christmas spirit at all. So he goes through um, trying to find Christmas spirit. And he's upset by everybody else, Lucy and, and Snoopy and all these others that have the wrong idea about Christmas as well. And the whole thing is about how he comes to the point where he realizes what Christmas is all about. And so I want this morning to talk about the Christmas spirit for us as Christians and as believers, you know, it's very clear. We know that Christmas is about Jesus. It's so clear. It's about Jesus. And yet we too get caught up in this whole thing about Christmas spirit. And we watch movies and we watch Christmas specials. And you know, these warm, fuzzy Christmas specials on television. It will, at the end, it, it will always be, after all, Christmas is about love, you know, or like that. Or Christmas is about family. Christmas is about giving, you know, things like, things like that. And you know, those things are not entirely wrong, and they're not entirely just Hollywood, if you will, because in fact, Christmas is because God loved and God gave his only family member, his son, Jesus. And so it is about love and giving and family. But I want us this morning, as we think about Christmas and as we are well into the holiday season, to come from a different perspective again as we come to think about the Christmas spirit, if you will. We're going to go over things that we know very well and some scriptures that we know very well. But just as a reminder again, as we come into, the, into this Christmas season, and I want to start from God's side first. I don't know about you, but I know for me, sometimes I just don't have the Christmas spirit. Do you know what I mean? Maybe I get very busy. Or maybe I start to get lonely because I'm far from home. Or maybe I don't have a lot of Christmas gifts, especially when you're younger, right? There aren't many Christmas gifts. Or I don't have a lot of finances to spend on Christmas gifts. Things are really tight. Or for whatever reason, if we're from the U.S. or from areas where at Christmas time it's cold or Germany or whatever and there's snow, and then here we are in Hong Kong. Now, those of you from Philippines and other places, no problem for you, but for some of us with a different background, you know, we wake up Christmas morning or Christmas Eve, and it's so hot we could wear shirt sleeves or sleeveless, and it's like, no Christmas spirit. Right, Beth? It's, yeah, you want, to, you, you want to be, it's there's no snow, there's no, and these are all sort of things that we think make up part of Christmas. So I want us this morning to come back, and let's just look very simply at some things in the Bible. Stay with me on this, you might think, oh, I don't know about this, Pastor Jennifer. We're going to look at the Bible, we're going to look at some verses, and I want us to start this morning with God's side of things, okay? Because that's where you have to start with Christmas. And so we want to talk about 
loving, giving, and family, very briefly, from God's side as we think about the Christmas spirit and what type of Christmas spirit we have. And so let's look first at a verse that we all know so very well. What might that be? John 3.16, okay? Let's look at John 3.16. I've told you before, this is one of the first verses I remember memorizing. And it was many, many years ago in Singapore. I think I was about four years old and I learned it in English. And I learned it in Cantonese too. San Oi Sayan, and then on and on and on. Um, so I remembered it. So parents, teach your, get your kids to memorize uh, Bible verses. What a great way to hide God's word. And it says in John 3.16, shall we read together? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. In one verse, we have all the things that the world thinks about at Christmas time, don't we? Love, family, and giving. Now they think of other things as well, but we see it all here in one verse that we know so very well. So this is from God's side as we think about Christmas. But I want us to look at another verse as well. 1 John 4, 9 and 10. And I'd like you, let's read this together as well. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. So we see from God's side a theme, don't we, when we think about Christmas. And there's one more verse that I'd like us to look at. Oh, I love this one, Romans 5, 8. Let's read that together as well. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. This beautiful, beautiful picture of love. God sacrificing his son and Jesus being willing to come to earth, not on the certainty that you and I would accept his love and turn to him, but on the possibility that you and I might accept his love and receive eternal life and turn to him. That is love. That is love. Because for some, this extravagant gift of love that came at such great price will be wasted. It will be a gift that is thrown in the mud and the dirt of this world and never appreciated and never enjoyed. And yet God was willing to do it. That's a measure of his love for each one of us. And so as we look at these verses, we see from God's side, as we think about Christmas, we see from God's side this theme, and it's just his love for us, his love for us, his love for us. And then we look at a wonderful verse that we don't think of usually, look at the next slide, as a Christmas verse, but it's from 2 Corinthians 9, 15. And we read, let's read this together. Thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. And he's speaking about Jesus. He's speaking about Jesus. And, and Paul says, thank God for this gift, too wonderful for words. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the Bible, Paul was, of all the writers of the New Testament and the Old Testament as well, Paul was the most eloquent the most well-educated of all the writers. And yet Paul himself says, this gift from God, this gift of Jesus, it's too wonderful for words. The words that I have cannot adequately express. And yet, writers throughout the Bible try to express this wonderful gift. And so let's look at some of the expressions of this wonderful gift. Let's look at what Isaiah says about this gift that's too wonderful for words. He's an Old Testament prophet we know very well. This was written 700 years before Jesus came. Imagine, 700 years. But the Holy Spirit enlightened his eyes and he prophesied this, the words that we know very well. Here are the words attempting to describe this gift that is too wonderful for words. And he writes... For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. In this verse is a description of all that is needed, 
all that is needed. And it came to us, all that we need came in the form of a small child. And the eyes of faith, and you and I have to have eyes of faith too, the eyes of faith could see in a small child what would be, and what would be was a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting father, and the prince of peace in a world that had no peace. But eyes of faith saw that. And Isaiah speaks in part with simple, with eloquent words of this gift that really is too wonderful for words. So that's what Isaiah says 700 years before. And then shortly before, just a few months before Jesus comes, somebody else, another person prophesies about the coming of Jesus. Look with me at Luke 1, 78 and 79. And these are the words of Zechariah. Who's Zechariah? They say, uh, I'm not sure. Zechariah was the father of John, who would become John the Baptist. His son is born a miracle. And that encourages me all over again, because John, the, the one who would be called John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, was a miracle child, a given to Elizabeth, who was barren and could not bear children. And then Mary, another, a virgin, and again, a miracle child, a miracle child. Brothers and sisters, our God does miraculous things. We sometimes look at situations and think there is no hope here. It's dead. There's no hope. But God brings life. God brings life. And Zechariah, in prophecy, says this. As he, look, as he looks at his son... And then he speaks of the one that is yet to, come, yet to come. He writes in beautiful words, because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death and to guide us to the path of peace. Aren't those beautiful words? The morning, the light, morning light from heaven, it's about to break upon us, this beautiful picture of being in darkness. And the darkest time, people will always tell you, the darkest time of the night is really just before the dawn, when it seems it's so dark before the light comes. And the light comes and then you, you can't even imagine that it was just dark. And that's how God, that's how God does. And that's how Jesus comes into our hearts and into our situations and into our lives. This is how he does it. And Zechariah, in beautiful, eloquent words, says the morning light is about to come. Um, and as I think about that, um, I, I was thinking about the timing of this because Zechariah says the morning light from heaven is about to break upon us. And the morning light was at this, uh, Eliz Elizabeth was six months pregnant when Mary became pregnant with Jesus. And so by this time, John is born, so it's just a few months more, and then Jesus will be born. And I was thinking about this because I was thinking about the timing of Christmas gifts. Um, already this morning, two people have given me Christmas gifts, and my Christmas gifts aren't yet ready for them. And I've already told them, I'm, I'm sorry, you'll have to wait till you come back from your trip, wherever, wherever that is. And we always have this idea, at least in the U.S., I don't know about Hong Kong, of people trying to get gifts for Christmas and they run out of time and they're running around on the 24th of December, going from store to store, trying to find just the right gift, but they've run out of time. And I don't know how many times I've told people, you're just going to have to wait till after Christmas. <laughs> you know, maybe I have it already, but I'm just busy and I haven't had a chance to. And what I love, what I love about these Christmas verses as we think about the Christmas spirit, is that God's timing is just right. God's timing is just right. Look with me at Galatians 4. And you say, there's a Christmas verse in Galatians? Yes, there is. Look at this, Galatians 4, 4 and 5. But when the right time came, when the right time came, and that encourages us, brothers and sisters, because Jesus is never too late and he's never too early. His timing is always perfect. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. He sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. God's timing is perfect. And not only that, God's gift is perfect as well. Have you ever received something from someone and you kind of looked at it and you thought, 
thank you, but not really my color, <laughs> you know? Or not really my style. My mom loves to give gifts, but when I was about 19 years old, after mother had given me and my sister some jackets that we wore one time and that was it, my mother announced, I'm never buying you all clothes again. From now on, you buy your own clothes. And you know, we don't always get it right when we give gifts to people, right? Sometimes we get it just right. It's like, oh, I love it. This is the perfect gift. But often we don't. The gift isn't just right. Or those of you who are parents, maybe your child, wears, when there's the thrill of the new gift, your child plays with it for 24 hours or a week. And then something else comes along that's prettier and shinier and louder and brighter, that's more interesting to them. The gift that is too wonderful for words is always the right gift for you and for me. And I want you to think about that. I'm not trying to give you fuzzy, warm feelings or be sentimental this morning. I really mean that, brothers and sisters, and I want you just to pause and think on that this morning. As you think of the various gifts you, have, you and I have received at various times, God gave us the perfect gift in Jesus. Jesus is the gift that we need. Jesus is the gift that we must have. Jesus is the gift that never wears out, never breaks, never gets old, is never not needed anymore, will never outgrow him. He fits perfectly. He's, he's just right. And that's why he's the gift that's too wonderful for words. When, when you think about that, as you're thinking of gifts, I, I really encourage you to do that. I know this is a simple message this morning. But as you give gifts to people, and as you receive gifts this Christmas season, because we're talking about the Christmas spirit, I want you to think about that. Think about the gift of Jesus that is the, he is the perfect gift for each one of us. God gave just what we needed. Isn't that encouraging? Just what we needed. Because he loves us so much and because he knows us so well. He gave us the perfect gift. Gift. Now, I want us to think about another aspect. So his timing is perfect. It's prompted on God's side, the spirit of Christmas. It's love. It's just, it's love, it's love, it's love. But I want to change gears just a little bit, and I want to give you a practical example. And please don't be offended with me. I, it, will, it will come clear in just a minute. I'm going to use an example from my own life. Sister Lisa, every year, gives me, I told them not to tell in the first service, but I'm going to use her as an example now. Sister Lisa gives me gifts every year, and almost always, she buys gifts in Germany and brings them back. She's very, very thoughtful. I, I really appreciate it. She's using her precious uh, luggage space to bring back gifts for people, and it, it's, it's so kind of her. So last Christmas, uh, she gave me a gift. And she had it wrapped up separately in two different parts. And so I opened it. I, I don't know if it was Christmas Eve or I think it was after. You know, for me, a lot of times Christmas is so busy, I, 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 it's a day or two after at least. So she had it wrapped separately. And first, I opened this thing. And I didn't know what it was for. And I looked at it and I thought, my first thought was, it's for the toilet. <laughs> I really, I, I'm not being crude, I really did. I thought, okay, well, it's for the toilet. And I looked and I thought, well, it can't be for the toilet. That wouldn't work. And, th and then somebody said, Wait, maybe it was for your car, you know, like a, tra like a traffic cone. And I looked at that. But I, re I honestly, and you may say, Pastor Jennifer, you're kind of slow. It's true, I'm kind of slow sometimes. I could not figure out its purpose. Now, some of you may have already. And then I opened the second part, and the second part was this. And I thought, do they fit together or are they separate? I thought, well, she knows I like kitty cats, and so this is, it's a little cat. And so I looked at it, and I thought, and I thought, oh, okay, oh, it goes here. So I thought, okay, it goes there, and I thought, is it like a decoration for my shelf? I mean, I really did. I really thought that. And then I finally figured out this is what it was for. Yeah. <laughs> ah, see, it took you a little time also, right? So that's what it's for. 
Okay, now please don't think I'm being sacrilegious here. There's really a purpose for this. So I figured out what it was, and Sister Lisa, I use it every day. It sits in my kitchen. It, it was a great gift. It was a great gift. And then for my birthday recently, she gave me something else. <laughs> And I had no idea what it was. <laughs> Somebody in the first service said it was a shot glass, but Sister Lisa is much holier than that. It's not a shot glass. And I looked, I thought, what is this? But fortunately, Sister Lisa had written a little note and she'd, paste, she'd put it right here. And she said what it was for. And I thought, oh, okay, got it. You know what it is? It's a toothbrush holder. <laughs> But it took me a while to figure it out, and if she hadn't put a note there, I'm not sure if I would have figured out what it was. And by the way, this is the toothbrush that I use at church. Pastors, you don't have to keep their teeth brushed. Why did I show you these and talk about not understanding what they were for? Because when Jesus was given as a gift to this world and to you and to me, people also misunderstood his purpose. People also misunderstood why he had come. And they thought, it must be this, or he came for that. Herod believed that Jesus had come to take his throne. And so Herod, in, violent, in violence and bloodshed, took the lives of innocent children to try to, put, to, try to kill Jesus. As Jesus grew, there were those who felt like the Pharisees and scribes, you've come to take our place. You, you're here, you're judging us. You've come to show us we are bad. You are this and this is why you have come. And there were people then, and there were people, and there are people now who still have misunderstood or just not known the purpose of his coming. That's why I brought those examples for you. You're going to remember those examples, I think. And, and I really mean that, not in a lightness in the sermon, but because there are many people who still they don't understand. Well, why did Jesus come? Is it so I can just be a better person? That's what a lot of people think. Oh, he was a good teacher, so I can do better things. Or there are those who, who feel like, this is God is this way and, God, and Jesus came. It's judgment and it's condemnation. And yet, if you'll remember John 3, 17, the verse that comes right after verse 16, it says, for Jesus did not come into the world to condemn or judge the world, but that the world might be saved and might have life. There's a world of, of people that still think, Jesus has come, or God's attitude towards me is judgment, condemnation. You're bad. You're going to hell. Brothers and sisters, those things are facts. Jesus doesn't have to say anything about that. Jesus has come to change that. That's his purpose. That's his purpose. And as you and I think about Christmas and the spirit of Christmas, this must be part of it. This must be part of it. Oh, thank you for the gifts, the Christmas carols. Those things are nice. But brothers and sisters, when we think about the Christmas spirit, if you will, this is what we have to look at. This is how we have to look at it. So I want to give you a few other verses this morning that are Christmas verses this morning. And very simply, from Luke 19.10. I love this translation. It's the New Century Version. And it says very simply, The Son of Man came to find lost people and save them. The NIV is, he came to seek and save those who are lost. And that's good too. But I want you to see it that way this morning. He came to find lost people and save them. Now you may not feel lost this morning. Well, I know what I'm doing and I know where I'm going. But if Jesus is not the pathway on which you are walking, if Jesus is not the Lord of your life, if the light of heaven does not shine on your pathway this morning, you are lost. You are lost. 
And what I say to you this morning, what I say to you this morning is this, and I don't know all of you here, mo most of you I do, but what I say to you this morning, first of all, is this. If you don't yet have that relationship with Jesus, we've been reading these verses, then Jesus, his purpose, he's come for you this morning. He has come to find lost people and save them and save them. That's why he came. That's why he came. Those of you who have already been found by Jesus and been saved by Jesus. Be reminded of that this morning. As you go through the Christmas season and you don't feel so Christmassy or cheerful or this or that, be reminded and say, oh, you've saved me. The purpose for which you came has been realized in my life. He has come to find, to save lost people. What are some other verses? Christmas verses, John 3, 16, so that we would not perish but have eternal life. Galatians 4, 5, he sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. You don't feel very Christmassy this morning because you're far from your family? Jesus came to bring you into the family of God, an eternal family, a real family, not just a warm, fuzzy feeling, really into his family. These are his purposes. There's more. The Bible says more, but very simply, this is his purpose in coming. It's clear. It's clear. And you may be wondering, and you may have been trying to figure out, just as I was trying to figure out, well, what is this for? What purpose is this? We, we wonder that way about Jesus sometimes. This is why Jesus has come. And I want to say to you this morning, if the purpose of God has been realized in your life, this Christmas season then you also have a responsibility for those who do not yet realize the purpose of Jesus. It's up to you to tell. It's up to you to show by your lives the reason that Jesus came. This Christmas season. This Christmas season. So when we talk about the Christmas spirit, I think all these things have to be part of it. And then finally, I want to talk about our response. And I want us to look at a few verses as we come to a close this morning. You know these verses very well, but I want us to see if we can see a pattern. So from God's side, love the perfect gift. From our side, in response, what is the Christmas spirit? What does Mary say in Luke 1, 46 and 47? Mary responded, Oh, how my soul praises the Lord. How my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. There's the Christmas spirit. What do the angels say? Luke 2, 13 and 14. The angels were joined by a vast host. They were praising God and they were saying, glory to God in highest heaven. Peace on earth to those on whom his favor rests. The shepherds, Luke 2, 17 through 20. After seeing him, they found Mary and Joseph and the baby. Just as the angels had said, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angels had said to them about this child. And then they went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Do we see a pattern here as we look at these? The spirit of Christmas, our spirit of Christmas, is to be one of gratitude. It's to, that's why this morning I said as you give your offering, really, Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for the gift too wonderful for words. The Christmas spirit on our side, it's to be a response of, oh, thank you, of praise, of worship. It doesn't depend on these external things that may or may not happen for us this Christmas season. It doesn't depend on the weather. It doesn't depend on whether or not you get a call from home and from your family and if they remember you and Christmas or not. It depends on on what Jesus has done and Jesus coming to us. And this is our response. This is, this is the Christmas spirit response. And then eight days later, let's look at two other verses. Simeon was an old man. He was in the temple and they had taken Jesus to the temple to be circumcised as the law said. And he takes the child, Jesus, in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace as you've promised. I've seen your salvation. And here's this beautiful picture of the eyes of faith. How can Simeon say that? Jesus is just a baby. He hasn't done anything yet except cry 
and everything else that babies do at eight days old. Really? But Simeon, with eyes of faith that God gave him, as God gives us as well, praises the Lord and says, I've seen, I've seen your salvation. And right then, along comes Anna, a widow for who knows how many years, what life she had, and she comes upon him just as Simeon was talking with Mary and Joseph, and she too began praising God and talking about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. Ah, oh, this beautiful picture of praise and sharing and telling. That's the Christmas spirit, brothers and sisters. That's the Christmas spirit. And then, sometime later, the wise men, Matthew 2, 10 and 11, when they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshiped him and they gave gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Here are some guidelines for us this Christmas as we think of the Christmas spirit. Here's some things to direct our hearts, to direct our thoughts, to direct our feelings this Christmas, whatever external circumstances are. As you go through this Christmas season, and you are so busy, I urge you to take time each day. You say, well, what's the takeaway from this sermon this morning? What do I do about this? Simply take these verses and these things that we've looked at and talked about. I've started doing it for myself earlier this week, each day. Just, oh God, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. And just being grateful. Thank you for this. And, and really specifically thinking of things, being grateful and praising and looking for some other people to tell as well. If you have few gifts under the tree, take time to thank God for the gift of Jesus that came at just the right time that is the perfect gift for you all that you need, all that you will ever need, wrapped up in a gift too wonderful for words. You're still unwrapping him. You say, well, there's this, but what about this? You keep unwrapping Jesus. Did you know that? You're never going to know everything to know about him until you get to heaven to be with him. But until then, you stay with Jesus and you'll keep on finding out more about him and he will be the gift that you need at the time of need. That's Jesus. That's Jesus. If your financial resources are really tight this Christmas season and you don't have enough to give or you've only got a little bit and you say, well, this is not going to be very Christmassy or festive this season or I don't even have enough to, to be part of the Christmas celebration at Hong Kong Kyun or whatever, take time to say, but God, thank you for the richest, most precious gift of all in Jesus. Let this be our Christmas spirit. So I want us to close with gratitude and thanksgiving, but I want us to do one other thing this morning because I don't know everyone here this morning. And I want to come back to this. The Son of Man came to find those who are lost and save them. And so as the rest of us are being thankful this morning and saying thank you, Jesus, I want to give anyone here this morning who is lost they haven't met Jesus yet. I want to give you the chance to be found by him this morning and to be saved. No better time. So we're all going to pray together. You don't have to use fancy words. None of us have to use fancy words. Use the words of your heart. Would you, as we all just close our eyes this morning, would you respond to the Lord based on what we have talked about this morning, these verses we've looked at. And as we do that, I'm first going to pray simply, and you can follow me if you want to. If you want to be found by Jesus, the purpose for which he came and to be saved, we're going to do that first, and then we're going to thank him. Let's pray together this morning. Jesus, I now understand your purpose in coming. You came to find lost people and save them. Jesus, I am lost. Find me and save me this morning. 
I don't understand everything, but I understand enough. Save me this morning. Give me your eternal life. Bring me into your family. I receive your love and your life. You came to take away my sin. Take it away right now. Make me clean. I am yours. Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you for the gift too wonderful for words. We thank you that you gave Jesus at just the right time. We thank you that Jesus is the perfect gift to us. He fits. He suits. He's just right. He meets every need. Thank you so much for your gift too wonderful for words. I want to walk throughout this Christmas season in thankfulness, in gratitude, in praise, in worship, in telling others about you. In your name we all pray. Amen. 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 Amen.